The next thing we want to talk about in this lecture is the fundamental theorem of finitely generated abelian groups. So in order to do that, let's first just talk a little bit about finitely generated abelian groups. So this is something we've encountered before, but let's review it. What does it mean for a group G to be finitely generated? It means that even if G is maybe infinite, there's a finite subset A of G with uh, the subgroup that generated by A is all of the group G. So remember, what does this mean? We saw it in two different ways. One, it's the smallest subgroup of G uh, containing the elements of A, containing A as a subset. But another way to say it is you take the elements of A and their inverses, and you take all of the words in G written in those elements. All right, where did we see this? Like, why did we talk about finite generating, finitely generated groups at all? Uh, one thing we proved when we were talking about group actions was that for every positive integer n, a finitely generated group has only finitely many subgroups of index n. So um, that was something that we talked about when we talked about group actions, even though a finitely generated group may have infinitely many subgroups, for any particular value of n, it only has finitely many uh, subgroups of index n. All right, so one more piece of notation before we state this big theorem. For each non-negative integer r, we're gonna let z to the r be our notation for writing the direct product of z with itself r times. And z to the r is just going to be the trivial, sorry, z to the zero is going to be the trivial subgroup. So in particular, z to the r is infinite if r is positive, and it's the trivial subgroup if r is zero. This is called the free abelian group of rank r. And this is one example of a finitely generated group. Uh, it's generated by r things that look exactly like the r standard basis vectors in rn or R in R to the R, or like Z to the R. So you just have one, zero, 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 one, zero, 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 one. And you can show that any subgroup of Z to the R that contains all of these, well, it contains all the linear combinations of these as well, like their span as vectors. So uh, Z to the R is generated by this finite, sub, uh, finite subset of size R. So even though when R is positive, this group is infinite, here we see a generating set of size R. So I'll pause and erase, and then I'll state this big theorem, the fundamental theorem of finitely generated abelian groups. Let's state this big theorem, the fundamental theorem of finitely generated abelian groups. Let's say that G is a finitely generated abelian group. The first part of the theorem says, that you can write G as a direct product. It's the direct product of Z to the R, some number of copies of Z, cross Z mod N1Z, cross Z mod N2Z, cross, 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 Z mod NSZ, where R and N1 up through NS are integers and they satisfy R is non-negative. Each of these NJs is greater than or equal to two and ni plus one divides ni for all i between one and s minus one. So what does that mean? So z to the r only makes sense if r is greater than or equal to zero. And we're saying that uh, each one of these ni's is greater than or equal to two. If you have uh, z mod one z, that's just the trivial subgroup. So z mod nz only makes sense when n is at least one, and we're just not gonna take any uh, trivial subgroups in this decomposition. We would just leave them out. So we get a bunch of z mod n z's where n is at least two. And we're saying that uh, we have z mod n one z cross z mod n two z cross z mod n three z. We're saying that n two divides n one and n three divides n two and n four divides n three and ns, the smallest one, divides ns minus one. 
So each one divides the one that came before. Okay. That's the first part of this theorem. It's, let me say, it's not at all obvious that if you just start with a finitely generated abelian group that you can write it as a direct product in this very structured way. The second part of this theorem is that this expression is unique in the following sense that, okay, so G is isomorphic to Z to the R cross Z mod N one Z cross 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 Z mod N S Z. Maybe there's some other way to write it as a direct product that looks like this. Maybe G is also isomorphic to Z to the T cross Z mod M one Z cross Z mod M two Z cross 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 Z mod M U Z where these integers T and then M1 up through MU also satisfy these two conditions here. Well, if that's the case, then everything matches up. Then T equals R and M1 equals N1 and M2 equals N2. MI equals NI for all I. So the fundamental theorem gives you that G is isomorphic to this direct product of some uh, number of copies of Z and then these cyclic groups, Z mod N Z for these Ns that satisfy some conditions and that that way of writing G as a direct product is unique. So, okay, before we go on and talk about examples, let me set some notation. This integer R in statement one is called the free rank of G. That's not a term that I'm gonna use very much these integers n1 up through ns also get names. These are called the invariant factors of G. And that is something that's gonna come up much more. Uh, and in fact, is something that I um, talk about all the time in my like research life as well. Like these questions about finite abelian groups show up and invariant factors are a good thing to understand. Okay, so this decomposition, this way of writing G as a direct product uh, is called the invariant factor decomposition of G. And let me just say that there's some information you can read off from G immediately just from looking at this direct product on the right-hand side. For example, G is finite if and only if R equals zero. If R is positive, then Z to the R is infinite. So the right-hand side is infinite. So G would have to be infinite. But if R is zero, then what is the size of G it's the size of the direct product Z mod N one Z cross Z mod N two Z cross 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 Z mod N S Z. And that's just the product of N one times N two up through N S. Okay. So I'll pause and erase. And then I'll talk about some examples of what this theorem tells you about uh, abelian groups of a given order. And later in this lecture, we'll see another equivalent statement of this fundamental theorem for finitely generated abelian groups, but specialized to the case of finite abelian groups. I've left up this first part of the fundamental theorem of finitely generated abelian groups that says G is isomorphic to a direct product of a particular form. I've erased the uniqueness part, but you can keep that in mind. What I wanna do now is talk about some examples. So let's look at Z mod 3Z cross Z mod 5Z. This is not in the form given by one. And why not? Because uh, N2 is five and that does not divide N1, which is three. And this statement requires that N2 divides N1. So where does that leave us? Well, it is true that Z mod 3Z cross Z mod 5Z is isomorphic to Z mod 15Z. How do you see that? Well, what is the order of the element one, one in Z mod three Z cross Z mod five Z? It's the LCM of the order of one in Z mod three Z and the order of one in Z mod five Z, which is three times five, which is 15. So this group really is cyclic. And Z mod 15 Z is in the form here. R equals zero, S equals one, and N one is equal to 15. So we started with a group that is not in this form a finite abelian group that's not in this form. And we found an isomorphic group that is in this form. So statement one in this theorem says that you can always do that. All right, as a next example, I claim that every abelian group of order 12 is isomorphic to either Z mod 12Z or Z mod 6Z 
Krasimad Tusi. Note that both of these groups are in the form given by this fundamental theorem of finite abelian groups, right? So finitely generated, but when r equals zero, we're just looking at finite abelian groups. Okay, so 12 is two squared times three. And what do we want? Let's use this statement, which is gonna say that every group G of order 12, every abelian group of order 12 is isomorphic to Z mod N1Z cross Z mod N2Z up to Z mod NSZ, where 12 is equal to the product of N1 times N2 up to NS and N2 divides N1 and N3 divides N2 and N4 divides N3 and so on. All right, so let's compare the prime factors on both sides. Three divides 12 one time. So three is gonna divide this right-hand side one time, which means there's exactly one ni that three divides. Okay, so what goes wrong if i is bigger than one? Like if three divides n2, then three can't also divide n1. So there's no way that n2 divides n1. So more generally, I mean, if i is bigger than one, then it's just not possible for ni to divide ni minus one because three divides ni and it does not divide ni minus one. So what does that mean? That means three divides n1. So same idea exactly, uh, two squared divides the left-hand side, um, which means it is possible for two to divide two different of these ni's. But if two doesn't divide n1, then there's some first ni that's even as you go along. And that means that that ni doesn't divide ni minus one. So two has to divide n1 also. So now what are we looking at? Two divides n1, three divides n1, so six divides n1. And you need a product of uh, n1 up through ns equals 12. Each of these um, ni's in your decomposition is at least two. So now we're in a case where there's only two possibilities left. I mean, six divides n1, 12 could divide n1, which would just make n1 equals 12. And that's our first case here. But if it doesn't, then six divides n1, which means that there's a two left over for everything else in the product. So n2 has to be equal to two. So we get z mod 6z cross z mod 2z. So in this way, you can start to see how you can use this statement to write down all the different possibilities for the invariant factors of an abelian group of order not just 12, but order n for any n. So I'm going to pause and erase, and then I'll explain a little bit about like what was happening here, but now uh, more generally. Building on this example for abelian groups of order 12, where we saw that both 2 and 3 had to divide n1, you can do the exact same argument to say that if g is an abelian group of order n, then every prime divisor of n has to divide n1, this first invariant factor in the invariant factor decomposition of g. Why is that? Well, if you had some prime that didn't divide n1, it would have to divide some first ni, some ni for the smallest value of i, but then there's no way that that ni divides ni minus one because your prime divides ni but it doesn't divide ni minus one. So that means that you don't actually have an invariant factor decomposition. Okay, so what is that telling us? Well, as a corollary, every abelian group of square free order must be cyclic. How do you say that in terms of invariant factor decomposition? If you have an abelian group of order n and n is square free, in the invariant de factor decomposition, you just get n1 equals n because n is a product of a bunch of distinct primes and each one of those primes has to divide n1. So that means that in fact, it must be n1. Okay, so this leads to a nice piece of notation that we'll uh, see, work with a little bit more on the homework. For any group G, doesn't have to be a finitely generated abelian group, any group, the exponent of G is defined to be the smallest positive integer n, 
so that x to the n equals 1 for all x in g. So it's certainly possible that there is no integer n that satisfies the condition of this definition. Like if you have z, for example, uh, any non-zero element, like the element 1, there's no n so that 1 uh, to the n here with additive notation n times 1 is never going to be equal to the identity of the group for any uh, positive integer n. So if no such integer exists, we say that the exponent of g is infinite, is infinity. OK, why did I bring this up now? Well, if you have an invariant factor decomposition of a finite abelian group g, so you can write uh, g as z mod n1z cross z mod n2 up to z mod nsz, where each one of these ni's is at least 2, and ni plus 1 divides ni for all i. So uh, this is a nice shorthand. We'll say that g is a finite abelian group of type n1 up through ns. That just means in an invariant factor decomposition, these are the invariant factors. So type tells you the invariant factors. And the reason that I brought up exponent now is a little exercise that we'll do on the homework, which says that a finite abelian group of type n1 up through nt has exponent n1. That this n1, this first invariant factor, is telling you an interesting thing about your group. It's telling you the smallest positive integer that you can raise every element to and always get the identity. All right. So let me go back now and revisit this argument from the top and say, what does it mean for ni plus 1 to divide ni? Well, this is, some, this is a positive integer. It's some product of prime numbers to different powers. This is a positive integer, some product of prime numbers to different powers. If you have a prime that divides uh, ni plus 1, divides it some number of times. If ni plus 1 divides ni, then the number of times your prime divides ni plus 1 better be less than or equal to the number of times it divides ni. Let me say this again, but now with this language of type. So let's say g is a finite abelian group of type n1 up through ns. So what does that mean? g is isomorphic to z mod n1z cross 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 z mod nsz. We know the order of g is the product of n1 up through ns. So take any prime that divides this order. Because ni plus 1 has to divide ni, or equivalently, ni divides ni minus 1, how many times does p divide ni versus how many times it divides ni plus 1? So p has to divide ni at least as many times as p divides ni plus 1. Why is that true? If this were not true, if p divided ni plus 1 more times than it divided ni, then there's no way that ni plus 1 divides ni. So this fact is really useful in understanding what your invariant factors can be. p divides ni at least as many times as p divides ni plus 1. So in the next video, we'll see how this leads in a very nice way to an equivalent form of this fundamental theorem of finitely generated abelian groups in the particular case that your abelian group is actually a finite abelian group.